Good morning, all. We may make, uh, make a, a beginning. And uh, I'm going to read just straight out of the, um, the yellow form here. The invocation, which comes from Romans 5, 1 to 6. That's to it. Like a call to worship. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into uh, this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Why we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And that is something so much that we can celebrate God, that he should die for the ungodly. We know we're all part of that, and yet, because of Christ's grace, we are saved. So let's prepare our hearts and minds, and also praise him now with a doxology. We praise you, O God. We praise you, O God. That's not uh, the first one. Good. Good. All right. Am I loud enough? Good. Good. Let's pray. Let's pray to a God who's done everything for us. Heavenly King, Lord and God, thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells in our hearts, who is God himself. Thank you for interfering in our lives that when we in our deception don't even want you there. Thank you that you convinced us of our miserable state and show us what natural deceit is and it's deep in our hearts. Thank you for the need to understand you as Saviour. And now that you, that, that we should desire you with all our beings and continue to fight the good fight, as we still do on this um, side of heaven, Lord, we pray that we can always give you the praise that you ought and the adoration and the glory that you deserve. Lord God, give us that continued understanding as we know you are infinite. And that infancy is what some, uh, we may not even understand even when we are with you. But thank you that 
you have given us our Holy Spirit and that you speak to us and that what Christ has done, dying on a cross, resurrected, that, he, that we should be alive in him always. Lord God, help us to understand a touch of that today as we go through your word, as we pray to you, as we sing to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So let's sing again. again. Come unto me, you weary, and we'll stand to sing. I just noticed in the um, announcement sheet that it's um, it's got what a wonderful saviour is Jesus, and that's that could be a good title. But my title is actually called um, uh, "You Have to Do Something with a Baby." So we're talking about baby Jesus. So the first reading we have is from Malachi three, one to five, and this is uh, the the emphasis is the suddenness of Christ coming into his temple predicted by Malachi and about John. So uh, we're going to read this responsibly. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way for me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But he will endure the day of his coming. And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a fire and like a soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then you offer to Judah and Jerusalem. 
will be pleasant to the Lord. As in the days of old, as in former years, and I will come here to the nation. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit in orphans, and against those who turn away an alien. Because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. As we also learn that as a baby, he's also a purifier. Even though he can't even talk or walk, Christ has an effect as a baby. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Lord God and Heavenly King, we come before you knowing we are a people of unclean lips and hands in need of your forgiveness. We have strayed in many ways from uh, you in thought and in deeds and in our actions. Being full that we can find some kind of happiness apart from your loving leading and guidance. We have offended you by breaking your laws and instructions, and neglected to put you first in our lives. As we have offended others, so we have offended you. Forgive us, we ask, and restore the joy that only you can give, according to your promise, that we may hereafter live godly, righteous and sober lives, especially in a culture hell-bent to destroy you. May we stand with all the armour and strength which you supply in your spirit to withstand the arrows of the devil and that we may understand his unrighteous schemes. May we understand the joy of your great gospel to save such wretches like us who had once no hope to have all hope. Thank you for Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. May we understand in every, uh, every day better and to look forward to being with you forever. Thank you for all your great promises to us and for our children and for generations after us. We pray that we can be the fruit of your hands, that we can please you, that when we do die, you would say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for proving your sacrificial love, that we may give up ourselves to you and for your people around. Accept our worship of you now, in this place we ask. To you be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, now we're going to the, our gospel reading. It comes from Luke, Luke 2, 21 to uh, 38. Again, we'll reread re this responsibly. This is Christ coming into his temple with Joseph and Mary. And when eight, eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law. And every mouth who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law, Lord. A pair of purple doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the into the temple, and when the parents brought him the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms 
and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Anna, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her father seven years when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was eighty-four. She did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. Coming up that very hour, she began to give thanks to God, to speak to him, all who were waiting for the redemption of Jesus. And now there is an insert. I'm just going to read it here. Now, this is a, a, I'd really like to emphasize two words in here. One is the heart, the heart, and the other one is a sign. So this is uh, um, Matthew 12, 33 to 42. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit, Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be judged, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he, said, he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. All right. Let's again praise our God in the singing of What child is this who laid to rest in Mary's arms is sleeping? And stand just. Silence, but we scream. 
So this continues on from what we had on our um, call to worship from Romans 5, 6 to 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'll just bring your attention to the announcements there. Um, so there is the combined service tonight in Nanda at 6 p.m. And um, Guido will be taking that. Um, Monday night there is a session meeting. 7.30 p.m. Uh, Tuesday will be the online Bible study. The link is there. And on Wednesday, the Women's Fellowship Group at Ascot. Uh, and in the evening, the, uh, the fellowship meal in the hall with the Bible study that's after that. And then Friday is the Young Adults for As uh, at Ascot. Um, and this Saturday is the prayer meeting. Now, is there anything else that I need to add from anybody else? Now, I've, I've combined the, um, like a, a little a children's address with the, the rest of the message, so it's the first part, right? But it's really for everybody. It's adults. Once upon a time, there was a mother bottle feeding her young 15-year-old son on her lap, and he was enjoying that nice warm milk which she lovingly prepared for him. And he was now old enough to have gained the use of his eyes to obtain information of what he saw and evaluated with his small brain. On this occasion, he observed that his mother also had a bottle and it was colored black, very different from his. And being curious, he reached out, wanting her bottle. No, said mother, Coke is for me and milk is for you. And being stubborn, as most of us are, he reached out again and again. And his mother said, no. But being ultra stubborn, as some of us are, he, he continued to reach out. All right, his mother said, willing to give him a lesson, have some, putting the bottle to his lips. Well, the first reaction was his face just cringed up. This black stuff was cold and it was fizzy. It poured out of his mouth and the response humored his mother. But the next reaction, though, caused his eyes to open wide. The sugar had done its job. It had reached every taste bud in his mouth. And a new sensation. He suddenly grabbed the black bo bottle still within reach. He wanted more. But his mother tugged it back. Oh, no, you don't. Milk is for you attempting to give him back his bottle. However, World War III broke out. 
between mother and child. Milk was no longer the favourite. Now, I have to ask some rhetorical questions here. But um, you, can, you can answer if you like. Do you think the baby, the baby son, knew the difference between want and needs? No. Do you think the mother knew best for the baby? She knows that giving her son a stable diet and coke would probably make him burst out in pimple volcanoes and unhealthy indeed. Only healthy milk for his child would have done it. Do you think the baby is in a position to understand why milk would be better for him than coke? No. Is mother then unloving when she disciplines and forces her son to drink milk and not coke? No. Milk is very loving. No. Our wants are as much like this baby, though in adult form. Before, we, before a loving God, we do know what is best for ourselves, do we? No. God knows the best for us. Do you think we can understand what God is doing to us? Most of the time, probably not. Did Jacob know what was going on with all the bad stuff that was happening in his life? Not at the time. And even at the end, he never got an explanation. We are before a loving God, and when we are honest with ourselves, our natural inclinations do not match up to God's decrees, and we do battle with God. But, we are, but God is completely trustworthy with all our needs, and he knows that left to ourselves, we will probably kill ourselves with coke. A spiritually non-nutritious slow poison but oh, it tastes good. Now, when we in, in this story we're we going to look at, Simeon gives a blessing through the Holy Spirit. And we've got to remember he's in rapturous joy. But when we consider the blessing in its deeper form, you'll understand that it's not what we would consider naturally a blessing. Now, I want you to use your imaginations of Simeon in the temple. Here he is coming into the temple. And after many years, he was there, being taught by the Holy Spirit about the consolation that was coming, Jesus Christ, reading through the scriptures. When he does come out, he recognizes the Lord straight away. Why? Because the Holy Spirit told him. He takes the baby into his arms, close to his heart, in rapturous and glorious joy. This had been prophesied about four centuries before in Malachi 3.1, where Malachi predicts John, the Baptist's coming, and Christ's herald, and the sudden arrival of him in the temple. Everybody who had been uh, studious enough, like Simeon and Anna, would have understood and recognised through the Holy Spirit who this baby was, and they celebrated who he was. But his sudden coming into the temple was missed by most. What most people saw was just another poor family with a baby to fulfil the duties of the law of Moses for their firstborn son by offering a pair of turtle doves. A poor man's offering. There was no red carpet, no coronation, no widespread media uh, attention, no halo, and all the teachers, the priests, the Pharisees, the scribes, they all missed the event. But in heaven, things were different, and that was reflected by the Holy Spirit in Simeon and Anna's rapturous joy. God revealed himself to these two. If you want to see what heaven is like, then all you have to do is look into the faces of these two people, their rapturous joy in holding that baby. They couldn't contain themselves, but they burst out in absolute joy 
and delight at God's coming and in elation spread the word. Heaven is all about a celebration. It's a celebration of Jesus Christ in God himself. Now, I, I, this is actually um, a second sermon on, a, on a, a two of them, and I'm going to deal with the four sayings that Simeon is saying in, the, in that blessing. But the one that's um, in the brackets, which is about Mary being her heart being um, pierced by a sword, we'll just t touch on lightly with some more on another one. Now, as we read this text, and I hope you leave your Bibles open to um, Luke 2, you'll notice that Simeon, it says there, has been waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit is upon him. Now, there is an interrelationship of the words there in uh, 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 consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our uh, consoler or our comforter, and he is God. So in... Uh, in um, Jesus himself in John 14, 16. And I'm just going to read that because it's an important part. And the emphasis here is on another helper. Now, I, I, it says this in Matthew 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or, or knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus himself in this passage in John 14, 16, promises another helper. That is, a person of the Holy Spirit. Helper can be translated from the, word, the Greek word paraclete as consoler, comforter, counsellor, or advocate. And this is the same here in verse 25 of our text for consolation. Now you can see there's the two words coming together. The emphasis on the word another in John 14, 16, meaning the Holy Spirit is the other, and Jesus, who is God incarnate, is the original. Therefore, Christ is also our consoler, and here in the text is the promised consoler that Simeon has been waiting for. The consolation is then a person, the person of Jesus Christ, here as a baby. How is a baby Jesus described? He is God's salvation. Verse 30. That God has prepared in the presence of all peoples. Verse 32. That's you and me. Then the baby is described as a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Verse 32. And for the glory for God's, uh, God's people Israel. This is the blessing that has come to all peoples, Gentiles and Jews alike, and also you and me, and also those still far off. So, Simeon now turns to them and blesses them, and he says to Mary these words. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. This child is appointed for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. This is what we now uh, come home to in this passage, and we need to understand something very clear about this. And, we, and it puts it all into context. Simeon is prophesying these saying in the context of a heavenly blessing. A heavenly blessing. As we, keep, as we keep this in mind, that it is a blessing, we will not lose sight of it. It will protect us from the natural inclination of what we think should be a blessing and what is truly the blessing of God. But now let's test ourselves to see if what God's blessing to Mary, to Israel, to us is. Simeon says this child is destined for the fall and rise of people. In other words, Jesus Christ is going to be a great divider. A sign that is opposed, basically hated. 
A terrible grief will pierce your own soul, Mary. And thoughts revealed. Doesn't appear to be much of a blessing, does it? It seems like Simeon is saying that this baby of yours, Joseph, Mary, is going to cause grief to Mary and much pain to yourself, Mary. But this is where we have to think God's thoughts after him and not our natural inclinations. Nobody likes to suffer pain and see pain in those who don't deserve it, nor on ourselves. So what is going on here? What is this blessing? We need to see this all in the context of the very heart of the issue. God's gospel is salvation plan. What has he been planning all this time from the very beginning, the foundations of the world? He is planning his own glory, the restoration of the world back to himself. So while Simeon's blessing may appear somewhat disturbing, it is the blessing of the gospel in a nutshell. It is all about Jesus Christ. That we may suffer as Christians, no one is going to bear the severity of the pain more than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. God incarnate is taking upon himself the sins of us all who belong to him. Now let's look at it a bit, a bit more closer at these sayings. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Behold, listen well, take note. Simeon's behold is not just for Mary, but for all of us. Mary understood clearly what God was doing. She knew that the Holy Spirit was upon her, and she knew that she had been a pregnant virgin. She marveled at Simeon's prophecy and knew that not only was it personally for her, but for all of humanity. By the time Luke set out to follow things closely for Theophilus in verse um, 2 of chapter 1, and for us, Mary must have been his eyewitness. This passage is, is only in Luke. It's nowhere else. So who else would have been his, his eyewitness? Who would have been Mary? Mary had pondered them in her heart for 33 years. She was the one who was there at the cross seeing her dear beloved son being murdered and tortured by ruthless men. She was the one Simeon called, uh, said a sword would pierce through her soul. And we have every reason in Acts that she was there in the upper room when Christ revealed himself to his disciples when they were praying for one accord in Acts 1.14. So she would have uh, um, seen, would have spoken clearly to Luke when he investigated all these things, writing down an orderly account of this book. Therefore, take careful note, Mary is our witness. This child is appointed, set, destined, laid for a purpose, a particular purpose, God's purpose. The word used here is like this child is laid out, like an unscrolling of a plan. The baby is the blueprints to show God's building of his great salvation for all those who are willing to see what he is about to carry out for his glory and for our complete happiness in that glory. And the incredible part of it is that we are included in that glorious plan. Our names are written in that plan. Our names are written on the baby. If Jesus is appointed to a task of salvation, and we are to be as Christ, like Christ, are we not also appointed for God's purpose? God doesn't make accidents or surprises. Your fulfillment in life and in death is not your own, but to fully to live life for God alone and his purposes. Each of us who are in Christ are created and all appointed for his work and his set tasks. Do you realize this in your own lives? Are you living that portion of God's plan in your life? Now let's see what that's, this plan includes. This, uh, uh, this baby is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel. The baby is going to be a divider in Israel. Many will fall, many will rise. Let's examine them for a moment and, and uh, uh, see. please see the gravity of these words. The word for fall, ptosis, 
is also used in Matthew 7.27, where Jesus describes those who hear his words and don't do them and contrasts them to the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So Christ is, it doesn't just say that it fell, but it was a great falling. The point is that those who hear and don't do, in other words, reject what he says, great is their fall, great is their ruin, their crash, great is their downfall. And as this word fall is severe, the other word rise is glorious. The child is appointed for the fall and rising, anastasis of many in Israel. That word, rising, in the New Testament, refers to the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection. I am the rising, the anastasis of life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, you shall, uh, yet he shall live. And anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And that was on the eve of um, Lazarus rising. So we could interpret this passage this way. Behold, this child is appointed, laid out for God's purpose, for the utter ruin and downfall and the rising from the state of deadness to a state of life and blessedness for many in Israel. How is this baby going to cause the fall and rising of many in Israel? By their response to him. And this is now connected with the, the baby being a sign that is opposed, spoken against. Simeon's second saying in verse 34. Simeon means something, and when someone, uh, sorry, signs mean something, and when someone speaks against a sign, they are saying, this sign is not saying what it's saying. I disagree and oppose it. But, you know, if you, do, if you think of it practically, a stop sign is a sign. We're either going to obey it or we're not. It's there for a reason. It's there for our good. Especially if there's a lot of trucks coming the other way. The baby Jesus, who cannot even walk or talk, is already a sign. And God has made the meaning of this sign plain for all to see. Consider some of the baby seekers up to that time. The wise men from the east who weren't even Jews who travelled a long way just to see this sign. The shepherds, who the angels disturbed in the middle of the night, and now there's Simeon and Anna. All these were led by God to the baby. They understood the sign. God made it plain to them, and they celebrated. They did not oppose the sign. Who then is Simeon referring to who would oppose and speak against the sign? Herod, he was also a baby seeker, Matthew 2, though not in the same company just mentioned. God led Joseph and Mary away from murderous Herod. Herod understood the sign better than some of the current uh, temple leaders of the day and maybe even church leaders today. He knew the scripture uh, about what the, the baby meant. And he tried to search him out with deception and murderous intentions. But Simeon's prophecy includes what is to come. This child is appointed for a sign that is, uh, uh, is opposed, spoken against. So in that sense, it's future tense. Matthew 12, 38 to 42, which we read earlier um, about this sign. You may think, when, uh, when we read that, that Jesus was being harsh here. They ask for a sign, and he calls them evil and adulterous. Let's understand one point here about why these people wanted to test Jesus by making cosmic sign from him, from seeking a cosmic sign. They had already observed up to this uh, time many miraculous signs that confirmed Jesus as the Messiah. What was their problem? These people were asking for a sign that they could use against him. They didn't believe him. No wonder Jesus calls them an evil generation. 
It is meaningless for Christ to give a sign when their hearts are hardened against him and oppose him. John 12, 37. Though he had done many great signs in their presence, they continued in their unbelief towards him. So Jesus says no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Matthew 12, 39. So what is this sign? The sign of Jonah refers to Jonah's three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, which overshadows the Son of Man being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12, 40. Jesus is referring to his death, his resurrection, his saving work. He is this sign. All people everywhere will read the sign and have to make a decision what to do with the sign. Jesus is saying to this evil generation that this sign of his death and resurrection will be their final opportunity to be convinced of who he is. Did they miss it or did they accept it? What did the Ninevites do when they heard the message of judgment from a prophet who was bleached white from the stomach juices of a great fish for three days? It would have been a sight to see. They repented. Jonah, who was only a shadow, a silhouette of the one to come, who was God's reluctant herald and had, had more compassion over a dying plant than the Ninevites, who seems then not to be a great prophet. Yet the Ninevites repented at the sign of Jonah, and now someone is even greater here, the Lord of Jonah himself. And they rejected him. What an evil generation. Therefore the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for the rate they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Matthew twelve forty one. How much different is that generation of our own? The sign of Jonah, Jesus Christ, draws attention to the need of a, a, a concrete response in repentance, as was the case of Nineveh in response to Jonah's message. Are we listening and are we responding? How much greater is our condemnation if we refuse to listen to the sign? And this leads to the fourth of Simeon's um, uh, sayings, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. The important word here is heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Now, in the English Standard Version Study Bible, it's got this comment about Proverbs 4, 20 to 23. Heart in Proverbs regularly refers to the center of one's inner life and orientation to God, from which a person does all thinking, feeling, and choosing. Taking words of wisdom into the heart is vital. They are life, verse 22. And wisdom's response to the heart is worth guarding because out of the heart flow all the thoughts and words and uh, choices of a person's life. From it flows the springs of life. Even as an infant, the Lord Jesus Christ is revealing the thoughts of people's hearts. Later in his ministry, as you read the Gospels, you can't miss the thoughts and intentions of people's hearts in Jesus' reactions to him. In Matthew 12, 22 to 37, Jesus doesn't hold back when the, where the Pharisees' hearts were. After healing a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, the Pharisees revealed themselves totally by their words, accusing the Lord of glory of healing by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Jesus made it clear that the attempt to label him as a blasphemer is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Their wicked words reveal the, the evil intentions of their hearts. They are bad trees. Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you see good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. 
We may want to keep our thoughts and intentions private and hidden, but this baby will expose all our thoughts and intentions of our hearts. His presence will reveal to all whether we are drawn towards him or we are repulsed away from him. The wise men, the shepherds, Simeon and Anna, all fell down in great delight to worship the baby. They recognise this, that Jesus Christ is the Saviour. You have to do something with this baby. Everyone has to do something with this baby. You are either going to fall or rise when you face Jesus Christ. You will inherently have only one of two reactions. Attraction or repulsion. Nothing more. When you look to the baby, there is no neutral ground, no grey area. There is no, there's only a rising or a falling, a yes or a no. There is either love or hate, humility or pride, delight or misery, life or death, heaven or hell. You are either going to say yes to the baby or you're going to say no to him. God in his wonderful grace is handing out his loving gift of the baby to us all. And all we need to do is to take him in absolute humility or you're going to reject him in absolute pride and bear your own sin with God's wrath forever. The thoughts and intentions of all people's hearts will eventually be revealed and they will be either follow the footsteps of one of the two baby seekers. Simeon, who thought the baby, though it should have been said that God led him to the baby in great delight, and the result is his life in heaven, of joy with Christ forever. Herod, who sought the baby with thoughts of murderous intentions, God in protection led Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus away from him. The result was death, misery and hell for Herod forever. What do we need to do? It is essential for us to understand that we are sinners before a God who is righteous requires complete justice for all sins. God requires death for all those who sin against him. And as he requires justice, he dared send his own vulnerable son as a baby. The Lord Jesus Christ, to who? Into the arms of men and women. He grew up before us, died the death that we should have died rose to life and paid the debt in full. What is left for us when we face this baby? God himself. Only to repent in humility and accept with gratitude his wonderful gift of salvation in the Saviour of this world and accept him as Lord of all. That is the glory. That is life. That is the, our celebration. And we, like Simeon and Anna, being led by the Spirit into rapturous joy, be prepared to meet our Lord Jesus Christ. We died in him and also raised in him. He has paid the debt in full for his glory and for our joy. He has done it all, and all praise be to him. And in response, let's sing again of, in glory of... Um, What a wonderful saviour is Jesus, what a wonderful friend is he. For he left all the glory of heaven and came to die on Calvary. And uh, we'll stay seated as we sing this, um, and the collection will be uh, uh, taken up.
Let me read you, uh, lead you in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly King, we do lack in our lives that security, that rapturous joy, that searching out the Saviour, like we uh, uh, Simeon and Anna. But we pray, Lord God, that you would fill us with your Spirit in such a way that our ferventness for it would always be kindled, that we can be a people to search the Scriptures and know that these things are so, and that through your Holy Spirit teaching us, making us learn, convicting us, correcting us, Lord God, to enjoy him, you, forever. Lord, we don't know what it's like in heaven on this side of it until we get there but you have revealed in your word aspects of it and we know that heaven is not a place in that sense but a relationship a relationship with you forever we pray Lord God that you make us real in our life so Lord help us to keep a humble a mind and a mind in tune with our, uh, the lives that we live on this place. Help us to be aware of the deceptiveness of the world, to train ourselves to be worthy for your kingdom of truth. Rid our pride, our selfishness, our attitude of slackness, of reading and reaching the word as we ought. Develop in us a foundation of truth so as not to be confused in a world of lies and hype, in a world of deceit where everything we look at is so designed to challenge the truth of your word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet, as, as bad as the world may seem, you are in complete control of history. It is your story, your story, your story. We take comfort in that. Evil and deceptive empires and rulers will come and they will go. But your word and your saving grace remain forever. We pray that you would be with us when we are tired, when we are sick. You know exactly what you are doing. You mature us for your own glory and our good. May we be attuned to you when it comes to your blessings to us. And we saw an example of that when Simeon gave it to Mary. That blessing was the gospel itself. That is your interest. And we understand that we need to tune our hearts and our minds, not to ourselves, not to the things around us, and not what we can gain, but to that gospel orientation like you did with Simeon. You are refining us so that we can be ready to be with you forever. And in this, we do put our requests to you as we trust in you wholeheartedly that our physical sufferings and the trials that we have, they can be relieved. But we know that ultimate relief is all in you forever. Lord, we pray that you'll be with our sick, that you would heal the um, bodies that are getting older but Lord may our hearts always be full of rapturous joy of where we're going and we could see that in Simeon who was aged and Anna who was very aged at the time they had all the ailments of age but their joy 
is what drove them, the joy in you. And Lord, so we can live and die in the peace to worship you forever. We pray, Lord God, for our government and this country. We ask that you will put some proper logic and reason of your truth, your word, into their hearts, and that they can rule over us in a way that would be peace and where the gospel can be spread. And we pray that you would use us in that work. And Lord, that your glory will be excelled. Deal with us as we ought, but as you ought, and uh, as you see fit. You are our Heavenly Father. And in Jesus Christ we ask that you would hear our prayer. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And we will sing uh, that one and, uh, and the last one after the benediction.
stay for a um, refreshments after the service but now lift up your hearts for the benediction and it comes from Hebrews 12 1 to 2 therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God.